In this video, we're going to get an introduction to the curved arrow formalism. And this is an extremely important system that shows how electrons move within and between organic molecules in organic reactions. The curved arrow formalism is also used to show the interconversion of resonance structures, and so you may have some experience with it from introductory chemistry. I want to make two points here. The first is that the curved arrow formalism is a system there are a limited number of legal moves. It's just like a chess game in that respect, and it's also like a chess game in that the number of possible combinations of the moves is very large. So it looks very complex, but we can boil it down to a number of simple moves, and really the foundational principle that electrons move from electron sources, which are specific locations in Lewis structures that we'll look at in this video and explore in a future lesson, to electron sinks, which are, again, specific points in Lewis structures that have the ability to accept electrons. The second point I want to make about the curved arrow formalism is it's not just a pretty way to show how reactions work. There is actually physical meaning to curved arrows. Curved arrows indicate orbital interactions. We'll talk about this in more detail in a future video. And they have real implications for how we can modify, improve, and accelerate, for example, chemical reactions. So understanding reaction mechanisms at the level of curved arrows gives us deep insight in how to advance organic chemistry and improve organic reactions. The curved arrow formalism is a system that shows the movement of electrons within or between molecules. And organic reactions are really based on this flow of electrons. The reaction mechanisms that we write for organic reactions are depicted using the language of curved arrows. And you will use these throughout your study of organic chemistry to understand organic reactions. Aside from giving us physical insight, as I talked about in the introduction, the nice thing about understanding reactions at the curved arrow level, at the mechanistic level, is that you can start to see similarities between reactions that on the surface don't look similar at all. Organic chemists use mechanistic similarities to group reactions together to make them easier to understand and appreciate. The foundational idea of curved arrows, really, is that arrows point from a bond or lone pair, which we call an electron source, as it's the source of electrons, where electrons are starting out, to an atom or bond where electrons land, which we call the electron sink. And the number of possible moves is limited here because the types of electron sources and sinks that can exist in Lewis structures are limited. Specifically, the only real electron sources that we have are those locations in Lewis structures where electrons are indicated, such as lone pairs, single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds. These are the only possible electron sources because these are the only locations in molecules where valence electrons, the most reactive electrons, are located. And so every curved arrow flow is going to start with flow from a source, be it a lone pair, a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond. And we combine this showing of electrons flowing from a source with electrons flowing to a sink. And actually the number of sinks is also limited. It's limited to atoms that lack an octet of electrons, or an atom within a single bond, or within a double bond, or within a triple bond. Now, this may seem natural and, and obvious, but it does limit our options. When it comes to electron sinks, the only places we can land electrons are on an atom, like so, or in some cases on a bond. If we use a pair of electrons to show, for example, the formation of a bond. So I'll switch colors to blue to show that. We could, for example, land a pair of electrons between X and Y to show the formation of a double bond, or between X and Y here to show the formation of a triple bond. We're going to develop this system further in a later video. The point I want to make here is that the number of moves is limited, and you want to be careful about how you use curved arrows to make sure that you're abiding by the conventions of the language and that your arrows make sense, at least from this perspective, of the moves are possible and do give rise to the products or intermediates that you're indicating. Every arrow that you draw either forms or breaks a bond. Lone pairs don't jump from atom to atom. So an example of what not to do might be something like this. Say you have a carbon with a lone pair and, I don't know, a nitrogen in another atom. We can't do something like transfer a pair of electrons from one atom to another using curved arrows. This doesn't make sense. In fact, that arrow would be interpreted as meaning the formation of a bond between carbon and nitrogen. So this type of electron flow 
we don't depict using curved arrows. Indeed, this is an oxidation reduction type of process, and these are extremely uncommon in organic chemistry anyway. All the electron flow we'll be talking about involves bond formation and bond breaking rather than dramatic electron transfer events like this. We're going to systematically enumerate the legal moves for curved arrows in a later lesson, but just to show you an example of how this reactivity works, I'll just give a quick example of a substitution reaction between hydroxide anion, which I've drawn here on the left, and methyl chloride. When these two species are placed in the same solution, a reaction occurs in which a pair of electrons from the hydroxyl oxygen attacks this carbon atom, the methyl carbon in methyl chloride, and chloride departs with a pair of electrons. From the structures of the starting materials and the curved arrows given, we can deduce the structures of the products, and that's an important aspect of this system as well. The curved arrows imply, in a deductive sense, the structures of the products. So what this arrow is telling me to do, for example, is to create a bond between the hydroxyl oxygen and the methyl carbon atom. This pair of electrons that's now part of the bond is the pair that used to be the lone pair in the hydroxide anion here. Anything untouched by a curved arrow remains, at least in a chemical sense, undisturbed. We move things just a little bit, but all of the bonds are as they were, the three CH bonds. The second arrow tells us that the chlorine atom has accepted another lone pair, and here again, the two electrons in the new lone pair on the now chloride anion came from this bond here. Curved arrows can also be used to show the interconversion of resonance structures, and we'll have a lot more to say about resonance structures in a later video, but for the time being, I just want to show a little bit about how arrow pushing works in a resonance context. This molecule is allyl anion, and as we'll see in a later video, it has the structural elements required for resonance, specifically a lone pair adjacent to a pi bond. And we can push electrons internally within this molecule, creating a CC pi bond and breaking the adjacent CC pi bond, forming a new lone pair on the carbon atom on the opposite end of the molecule to create a resonance structure of what we started with. The new resonance structure contains a pi bond between the central carbon and the right-hand carbon that is composed of the electrons that used to be in this lone pair in the original resonance form. The left-hand carbon bears a new lone pair here and a negative charge, and the electrons in that new lone pair are the electrons that used to be part of this bond right here, which we've shown being converted into a lone pair via this second curved arrow. So we've seen so far how the curved arrows show us what bonds are made and broken. One final point I want to make before leaving these examples is that the formal charge changes are also implied by the curved arrows. So for example, the hydroxide here is serving as an electron source, and because a pair of electrons is going from a lone pair to a bond, we see an increase in the formal charge of that oxygen by one unit, because Formerly, it used to bear two electrons in the form of this lone pair, but after that lone pair is converted into a bond, now it only formally bears one of those two electrons. So it's gone from formally negative to formally neutral, a change in formal charge of plus one. Likewise, the chlorine atom that's serving as the electron sink is going from neutral to negative. That's because it has a bond in the starting material, and so formally it has one of the two electrons in the bond. But once we push that pair of electrons onto chlorine, it now has two electrons formally, where it used to have one, and so its formal charge decreases by one unit. And this is general for electron flow. The source increases in charge by one unit, and the sink decreases in charge by one unit. In fact, we see the same thing in the resonance structures. The carbon acting as the source on the right-hand side of the molecule undergoes a change in formal charge of plus one. It goes from negative to neutral. The carbon atom serving as the sink on the left-hand side of the molecule goes from neutral to negative one, and so its change in formal charge is minus one. Notice that this fits the pattern from above. The sink decreases in charge by one unit, and the source increases in charge by one unit. 